How are we doing? Good. My name's Ty. I'm one of the pastors here. We're really glad that you're here. I know there's a lot of places you could be today. You could be in bed. You could be out uh, hanging out with your family. I'm glad you're here today. Thanks for making an effort to be here. And I believe God has a special blessing for you. I want to pray. Um, and if you need a Bible, like after I pray, slip your hand up. Someone will bring one to you. Uh, we're going to look at God's word together in the next part of our service. So would you pray with me? <clears throat> Jesus, we come to you now. We thank you that in the midst of everything that's happening in our personal lives, that we can come to this place and gather with this group of people that I love so much and seek your face together. God, I pray over the next few moments that we would enter into this passage, try to understand the conflict that's there and the encouragement that is there for us as Jesus followers. God, may we as a church take your word seriously. Uh, may, May we take it into our hearts and into our minds and may it just overflow into the way that we believe and the way that we live our lives. And together we all said, amen. All right, so if you need a Bible, raise your hand. Someone will bring one to you. I have in front of me, this is the box of Legos that lives under one of the beds at my house. And uh, how many, like, how many of you have Legos in your home? Right, a lot of you have Legos. So when my kids go to my folks' farm, there's like these red, it's like a red suitcase, but it was made by Lego. My brother and I each had our own like red suitcase full of Legos. So my kids played on, uh, played with those Legos and they were growing up. Um, and now some of my, like my brother's son, his, my nephew, his kids, like they're playing with those Legos too. So I don't know what like images or feelings come to mind. For me, it's nostalgic. For some of you, it might be like traumatic. Dads, how many of you have stepped on these like late at night trying to, your children's trying to go to the restroom and like you step on these, it's like this, this dart that goes through the foot and uh, it's not a good thing. Or like you, you made one and like you made it perfectly because it came as a set. And so you made it perfectly and you set it on a shelf and then a sibling came and took it and modified it and it's no longer your toy. Or is your experience like this? Eventually all Legos end up just in a box sitting underneath, like underneath one of the beds. Raise your hand if you have a box of Legos that are no longer sets, but they're just kind of underneath the bed. Okay, so uh, that, that's probably most of our stories. Backstage, the worship team, they were playing with these. And I believe this one is the drummer, Kevin's. Uh, I'm pretty sure that does not look like the packet that it came with. <laughs> There's a gargoyle and a doll. No, it's a shark. A gargoyle and a shark on like a monster truck that also flies and like doubles on weekends as a space shuttle. Uh, and Sam, the guitar player, made this one. His is much cooler. Sorry, Kevin. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so why did I bring Legos up here? here? Here's what I want to talk about today. I think throughout the book of John, throughout the gospel of John, who are the people that Jesus continually has conflict with? I think there's plenty of conflict with Jesus outside of religion. I I know that to be true. There are people that I interact with here in Muscatine, even today, that are very non-religious, that do not want to enter into the conversation about Jesus at all. I know that's true. But in the book of John, in the gospel of John, the people that Jesus continually has conflict with are the most religious, the most theologically prepared people on the planet. The people that were like guarding the gate of theological goodness and truth, those are the people that completely missed the boat when it came to Jesus. So let me say it this way. Theology, religion, tradition, rituals, all of those things got in the way in Jesus' day of people actually coming to know Jesus. It became a block. Jesus did not fit into the religious structure that they had created. And for that reason, they didn't like him and they sought to kill him. I think that's the lesson I want to look at here today. And I think the church is a very difficult place to raise kids. Uh, I think it's difficult to raise kids, period. Like this human I'm responsible for, I have to train them up, right? But now add like the spiritual element to it. As parents, We are the main disciple makers in our home. Mom, dad, it is your responsibility to teach your kid about Christ, about God, about all these things. It's heavy. It's the hardest part of potty training is nothing compared to trying to help your kid understand God, understand the gospel, right? Why is that? 
because you're not just raising a spiritual person, you're raising a citizen and you, you want them to be a good person in society. You don't want them to murder. You don't want them to steal. You don't want, you don't want them to lie. You want them to be a good friend. All those things you want for your kid, just like you want them to like hit the toilet when they're learning potty training, right? None of those things have their foundation in Jesus Christ. In fact, I would say that a lot of times we as parents, we settle for good behavior. And as your kid grows up and becomes a teenager, we settle even more like, oh, I'm so proud of my kid for keeping his nose clean. Like he's just not in trouble. He's a good kid. There's nothing wrong with that. But let's not kid ourselves into thinking that being a good kid is the same thing as having a relationship with Jesus Christ. In fact, I would say in the passage we're going to look at today, we're going to see that religion, good behavior actually got in the way. And I'm going to say became a substitute for spiritual depth. The things, the traditions, the rites, the rituals, the festivals, those things became so important to people. And the outward appearances became so important. They exchanged those things so when God showed up on the scene, they were not even available to him. Church, let that, be, let that not be said of us today. That we care so much about the outward appearance. We care so much about our rituals, about our church's traditions, that we miss the person and work of Jesus Christ. Amen? Okay, let me say one other thing. I'll pull it together. Kind of emotional today. Um, <clears throat> for some of you that grew up in the church... You've been handed a version of your faith that doesn't make sense to you. Like as you have grown up, your parents' faith transferred to you, handed to you in a cute little, I'm going to call it Lego package. It made sense when you were a kid. And now that you're becoming an adult or you are an adult and you're in your 30s somewhere and you're starting to question things for yourself finally. Good job, by the way. Like start thinking for yourself. It doesn't make sense to you. And so you begin to... Sorry, Kevin. You begin to deconstruct what has been, oh man, he built it well. I can't get it apart. You start to deconstruct what's been handed to you. I felt so bad doing that, Kevin. I'm so sorry. And, and so it didn't make sense. You deconstructed. That's a common word today. And then eventually it just ends up in a pile of no use to you. It sits under your bed and faith has become something that is no longer useful to you. I'm going to challenge you today. I really like the idea that you are deconstructing your faith. I know like pastors and churches and Christians are really scared of that word. I'm not at all. Because when Jesus came onto the scene, he just deconstructed people's faith like crazy. Like all the parts that didn't make sense, Jesus like, nope, 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 nope. I like that. That's really good. My challenge to you, if that's you, we need you in the church because when you get to be like, like on the downhill slide, which I am because I just turned 50. Like I'm on my way. I like the version of faith that I've constructed. I no longer want to ask those difficult questions. Young people, we need you to ask us those hard questions so that our faith is purified, is pushed through the fire, and it is more pure and true to the scriptures and true to Jesus Christ. What I don't want to have happen is that whatever version of faith you were handed, some are really good, some have not been good. Parents, you've, you've handed your kids a version of faith that's not honest. It doesn't work in the real world. And it is not true in your own life, if you're honest. Like you kind of made it up because it kind of fits the way you want to live your life. But it's not actually leading you to the person of Jesus Christ. And it's not actually based in scripture nearly as much as you think it is. It's based in your politics. It's based in your culture. It's based in how you're living your life right now. So if you're here today or you're watching this online and you say, hey, faith, the version of faith, the cute package that was handed to me no longer works for me and you've deconstructed and it's sitting in a pile under your bed, pull it out. Like I'm really okay with you deconstructing what you've been handed. What I'm asking you not to do is leave it in a box under your bed where it's of no use to anybody. Start putting the pieces back together the way that Jesus would want you to put those pieces back together. Don't abandon your faith because someone handed you a version that just wasn't quite right. Okay, let's, let's jump into the passage today. Uh, we're going to be in John chapter 7. I thought Pastor Osway did an amazing job last week. He's such a gifted preacher. He's on vacation. Um, so please don't text him, email him for the next couple of weeks. <clears throat> We're going to hop in and uh, I'm going to try and explain it as we go. And then again, not try and get bogged down on things that are not the main points, but really bring, bring it back again to the end. 
uh, to the main points. John chapter 7, verse 1. After this, Jesus went around in Galilee. Galilee is kind of in the northern part of uh, Israel. He did not want to go, about, to go about in Judea, that's where Jerusalem is, because of the Jewish leaders there were looking for a, a way to kill him. But when the Jewish festival of the tabernacles was near, comma. So we're going to stop right there. Just the first two verses. So what do we know right now? It says after this. And then we know that the feast of the tabernacles, the festival of the tabernacles was happening right now. And we know that people are trying to kill Jesus. So let me give you a little bit of context. Um, the Passover is talked about in chapter 6. So chapter 6, verse 4 is the Passover. So we know that happens in the springtime. And then the next famous festival slash pilgrimage would be Pentecost, seven weeks after that. Six months after the Passover, they would celebrate the Feast of the Tabernacles. And the Feast of the Tabernacles is simply this. Um, they would all come to Jerusalem. Every male was re- kind of required. It was um, implied that you would come. And, and whether you lived in Jerusalem or whether you lived far out, um, you would celebrate the idea of the booths or the, the, the festival of, of tabernacles. It just basically means tents or shelters. And so it was an effort to spiritually remember how God had taken care of the Israelites when they were out in the wilderness. It's this idea of remembering and learning and dwelling on, wow, God was really good to us. And so even people that had houses in Jerusalem, they would either like put a tent on their roof or in their backyard or wherever they would. And, and they would go and they would, they would camp and try to, to remember and dwell upon the goodness of God to them and not be distracted by their material wealth or whatever they had and just be in a tent for eight days. Um, eight days, that would be a week in Spanish. If you say like, we say every seven days here, but really it's eight days, right? In English, we say every seven days. Spanish is cada ocho días. That's, and that's what it would be. So, so a full week of celebration of this. So people who live in tents, it's maybe the most popular one. Like it just was full of people. So that, that's first thing, you know, the timeline where six months has passed. By the way, we're six months now from Jesus being crucified. So just to kind of keep that in your mind, John is going to spend the rest of the gospel of John, the majority of the gospel of John spent on the last six months of Christ. None of the other synoptic gospels do that, but John does. He's like, I want you to pay attention to the last six months of Christ because it's so important. Um, Why were the Jewish leaders trying to kill him? Well, it goes back to chapter 5. If you remember chapter 5, verses 1 through 14, that's when Jesus on the Sabbath went into the temple area and he found the man who was an invalid for 38 years. Remember that? We talked about that uh, about a month ago. He heals the guy and, and that's when they find out, the guy didn't even know who Jesus was. Again, like it's so hard to like not see this connected. It was not the man's faith that healed him. We have to be careful. Like if you believe it, if you name it, you claim it, God's gonna give that to you. He didn't even know who Jesus was. When he went to the temple, they said, who healed you? You've been paralyzed for 38 years. Like, I don't know the dude's name. If he didn't know the dude's name, he clearly did not know that Jesus was God or that he could put his faith in him. Jesus did that to enter into the Sabbath and say, you guys think the Sabbath is what it's about. The son of man is Lord of the Sabbath. And and in chapter five, this is what Jesus says. When, When he's confronted with the religious leaders, he's like, God continues to work on the Sabbath which is what every good Jew believed. They believed that we rest on the Sabbath because we trust that God is going to do the work for us. So I'm not gonna work. I'm gonna trust that God's gonna provide. But they believed that God continued to work. Psalm says that God is the one that wakes you up in the morning. God brings life. He ends life. Like God never sleeps, never slumbers. He's gonna work on the Sabbath. We are not because we're not God. We're gonna trust God. Jesus said, if God is working on the Sabbath, how can I not work on the Sabbath? And that's when they said, this dude is saying that he's God. And that's, so they're still mad at Jesus because they believed that he was claiming to be God. So they're looking for him. He has not been back to Jerusalem since then. They're looking for him to kill him. Um, Let's keep going. Verse three, Jesus's brothers said to him, Leave Galilee and go to Judea so that your disciples there may see the works you do. No one who wants to become a public figure acts in secret. Since you're doing these things, doing these signs, these miracles, these wonders, show yourself to the world. For even his own brothers did not believe in him. 
So this, this isn't a main point, but you may be from your church background and maybe you just never heard that before, that Jesus, it has been taught that Jesus did not have brothers and sisters, that the Virgin Mary continued to be a virgin the rest of her life. That's just not true. I think I understand the reason behind that. It's just not necessary. Like the idea that, that Mary was a virgin her entire life, like she's more revered that way, more honored that way. That, that does not line up with scripture. It doesn't line up with scripture here. It doesn't line up with scripture in Acts 1.14. Um, so Jesus' brothers here did not believe in him. After the resurrection, they did believe in Jesus. Uh, we see uh, James, the, the brother of Jesus. Um, 2 Corinthians 5 talks about one of the siblings of Jesus. So I count Jesus maybe had four-ish brothers that, that we know of and at least two sisters. That's what I can come up with. I'm not going to like die on that hill, but, but there, Jesus had brother, half-brothers and half sisters. So again, it's not, it's not important. I just want to point that out. Like um, sometimes we come up with traditions that aren't necessarily from the Bible and they're, it's worth a really good cause. Oh man, Mary was so great. And she was, I don't want to take anything away from Mary, but nowhere in scripture do we see that Mary was a virgin perpetually, like the rest of her life. It's just not necessary. And it's definitely not biblical. His brothers um, said, Hey, Jesus, Like, if you ever want to make it on, like, a world-class level, we've seen the things you can do. You need to leave the small stage of Galilee, and you need to go to this festival. Like, thousands and thousands of people. Right now, you're playing the little stage. You need to go play the main stage because you'll be a huge hit. And I don't know where his brother's hearts were. Like, if, if they... Uh, believe that, okay, we know that you good, do good stuff. We know that you're pretty amazing. Maybe they're trying to exploit him. I don't know. But verse, uh, verse five says very clearly, for even his own brothers did not believe in him. So whatever they believed about Jesus, they did not believe. John's making it clear. They did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah, that Jesus was God, and that he would deliver them. And again, this isn't the main preaching point, but have you ever thought about like, um, Jesus having conflict with his siblings. Have you ever thought about that? Like, I, I love the idea that we see in Hebrews that Jesus is our great high priest. You guys have thought about it? being tempted or ha- having gone through trials, every kind of trial, every kind of temptation that we have gone through. And that makes him a great high priest better than anyone because I can understand you a little bit. Like if you're struggling, I have struggles. Like, yeah, I can kind of identify, but it says Jesus understands your struggle and is available to you like nobody else. Like no priest, like no counselor, like nobody. So specifically, this would say that these brothers did not believe in Jesus. They're maybe trying to exploit him. They're definitely not on the same page. They don't understand Jesus's mission of why he came and there's conflict. And, and so I know that in this room, 100%, there are some of you that are, that are experiencing conflict with a family member, maybe a spouse, maybe a, a kid, maybe a sibling, maybe you're fighting over like estate and inheritance stuff. Can I just say like, no one's gonna, under, gonna understand you better than Jesus Christ. Like maybe you feel nobody understands me, what I'm going through, Ty, like the complications in my family. I would say that Jesus is 100% available to you. He understands you. He is your great high priest. It says he intercedes for us. Could I just encourage you to go to Jesus and, and yes, go to your counselor. Yes, try and talk it out with a friend. But have you started with Jesus? This verse would show like he understands the family strife that you may be going through. Um, what we also see in John is that Jesus very intentionally, uh, chapters 5 through 10, Jesus enters into religious practices, festivals, and the practice of the Sabbath very intentionally. So go back to chapter 5. On the Sabbath, Jesus goes and heals this man at the pool. Well, it's very intentional that Jesus did that way. And then um, in chapter 6, in verse 4, on the, on the, the, during the Passover, Jesus goes into the temple and begins to teach about the Passover and maybe there was something new coming. And now he's going uh, to go into Jerusalem on the festival of the tabernacles or the booths. Like Jesus is trying to, if you can see that, all chapters five through 10, Jesus enters into religious rituals and traditions that people have and tries to get their attention and say, hey, it's, it's a little bit bigger than this. This has kind of replaced the purpose. And so just, it's just good for us to note that. Verse six, therefore Jesus told them, his brothers, my time is not yet here. For you, any time will do. And I don't think Jesus is trying to be offensive, but he's saying, hey, for you, like 
any old time will do for me. Like I'm on mission. And there's a very specific time that I'm not afraid to die. That's not why I don't want to go down there. Like I came to die, but the timing is very important. We know that six months from now, Jesus is going to willingly go to the cross to die during what religious festival? You know, the Passover. That's right. Why? Because it's so rich. People's hearts were attached to this rich tradition that for many, many years they've been celebrating the idea of the Passover. And Jesus sits with his disciples and said, hey, this is really good, but it actually points towards a new covenant. It's my blood. It's my body, which is shed for you and broken for you. Do this in remembrance. He's trying to get people's attention about wherever they are in their religious traditions and turn them towards a deeper meaning. Verse 7 and eight are very interesting. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify that its works are evil. You go to the festival. I am not going up to this festival because my time has not yet fully come. So see in John chapter one, verse 19, Jesus says that he is the light entered into the world, but the world did not receive him. They rejected him, but he came and he exposed the darkness. In John chapter three, verse 19, it says that the light came into the world and exposed the darkness and they did not like it. So I think there's two things that are probably true here. Jesus, when you stack up Jesus and what he came for against the world, we'll call it the way that the world without God wants to live their life there's going to be conflict for sure. And that's one of the reasons people don't like, I'm going to say Christianity, because it, it, it requires us as people to come face to face with Jesus, come face to face with what he calls sin and say, I have a sin problem that only Jesus can solve. So I, that's totally true. But in this context, and again, throughout the, the gospel of John, the people that Jesus is exposing as sinners are who? the most religious people on the planet. So go back to John chapter three, Jesus meeting with Nicodemus. It says that Nicodemus was the greatest teacher of the land. So that means he's well-respected. The dude is legit. He, he teaches really well. He understands the scriptures. He's living a godly life. People are looking at him. And when Jesus and Nicodemus, they meet, have this nighttime meeting, what does Jesus tell him? Like, oh, Nicodemus, you're so close. Like, you're so close. Good job. You're, no, he said, you're so far away. Like, you're not even close, Nicodemus. Like, all of this, throw it away. You have to be completely reborn. Shocking, right? Like, all the good things you're doing, Nicodemus, you're not even close. And then in the very next chapter... The people thought that the woman at the well was so far. Like they're looking at this woman and say, oh man, if anybody's long gone, it's this lady. In fact, we shame her and look down on her so much that the time that she has to go to get water is midday when no one else is there because she's not even close. And Jesus meets with her and is like, you're thirsty, right? You're so close. You're so close. Believe in me and you'll thirst no more. You see that? That is the consistent story that we see with Jesus. In fact, we see that the religious people are oftentimes the furthest from the truth and the broken and the hurting. Those are the people that really get it quicker. And so there's a caution for you and I. Like sometimes, at least we see this in the Gospel of John. I'm not accusing you. But in the Gospel of John, we see that there has been a clear substitute for knowing God. And that, are, that is outward appearances, rituals, traditions, good theology, exchange for when Jesus shows up on the scene, we don't even recognize who God is. That's the caution for you and I. Verse 9. After he had said this, he stayed in Galilee. However, after his brothers had left for the festival, he also went, not publicly, but in secret. So here's how I read that. By the way, the, it, it almost sounds like, wait, he told him he wasn't going to go. Why is he going? Was he dishonest? I don't think Jesus wanted to be put on public display. I don't think Jesus said, hey, my time's not yet. I want to go, but I want to go on my terms. My brothers, they want to go and exploit me and put me on display and maybe for the fame or whatever, for the power that would come with a guy that's doing all these miracles. And Jesus said, you go on ahead. I'm going to go on my own terms. I'm not going to go and, and go with you. But I like, 
in my mind, the way I read my Bible, it's, which is kind of scary, like I see Jesus in a like disguise, like with big mustache, glasses, trench coat, hey, what's up? And like healing people just as they walk by, like what? Uh, but, like, so, but for whatever reason, that's the way my brain works. He went and he did not want to be seen. So he goes to the festival, um, but Jesus did not want to be known. He wanted to be on his terms. Doesn't want to be in the limelight just yet. Verse 11. Now at the festival, the Jewish leaders were watching for Jesus and asking, where is he? Among the crowds, there was widespread whispering about him. Some said, he is a good man. Others replied, no, he deceives the people. But no one would say anything publicly about him for fear of the leaders or religious leaders. So this is all kind of the behind the scenes stuff. And I wonder if like Jesus could hear this. Um, like pe- Jesus was the talk of town. People were expecting him to show up and do some amazing things, right? And, and when he didn't, the, the religious leaders were looking for him to arrest him and kill him. And somehow, by the way, that was against the law, but they were looking for a way to kind of get him arrested, get him in trouble. People were asking questions. Some were right, some were wrong. Some were not wrong, but they weren't right. Was Jesus a good man? Yes, but he was so much more. Like, so they weren't right, but they weren't wrong. Others, they believe something completely different. I think what's interesting is that the religious leaders did not give permission to people to explore their doubts and fears. And I think that actually is an unhealthy characteristic of any community of faith. I think one of the things we want here at Calvary is for you to say, hey, I don't really understand this. Show me uh, where you get that in the Bible. Well, we just kind of do it this way. Oh, okay, so it's not really biblical. We just kind of do it this way. Shh, stop questioning what we've done, right? I think the healthiest environment we can provide is an environment where you can come with your questions and you can honestly seek the truth and we're not gonna shut you down. Now, some people like to argue and they just like to argue and like, and they like to come to me and just want to debate things that quite honestly, we're not gonna get the answer to, but it's the thrill of the debate. So you don't have to come to me if you're that person. But if you're honestly seeking the truth and you're like, hey, I don't understand why we do communion the way we do communion. Hey, I don't understand why we do baptism the way we do baptism. Can you like help me understand that from the Bible? I'll take that question all day long. We should take that question all day long. Um, To not allow people to question or to doubt, you're putting a nail in the coffin of what their faith could become someday. A stronger, push through the fire faith that is their own instead of what was handed to them in a cute little Ziploc bag. We need to not just deconstruct our faith. We need to make sure we push our faith through the fire so it's actually biblical and pointing people to Christ. Verse 14, this is about halfway through the week. Not until halfway through the festival did Jesus go up to the temple courts and begin to teach. The Jews there were amazed and asked, how did this man get such learning without having been taught? So Jesus doesn't stay a secret forever. About halfway through the week, he goes to the temple and he just starts teaching people. We don't know what he taught, but it it must have been amazing. Maybe not controversial. Maybe it was like pointing people to God in a new and fresh way that that people just didn't understand. But do you see what they're amazed by? Jesus did not have a rabbi that he studied under. There was no ability to have credentials of your own in that day. You were the uh, disciple of this famous rabbi. You were trained under him for a certain amount of time. Then you could become your own rabbi and have your following. Jesus did not do that. We don't have any record of that. We, we know that he studied, but he didn't study under a rabbi. And then he just went and said, I'll take you 12. You guys have no education. You're fishermen. You guys can come follow me. You can be my disciples. Jesus was outside of the parameters of what they understood, good teaching that you could trust could come from. So it was blowing their mind um, that that Jesus had the ability that he did. Um, In Acts chapter 22, verse 3, uh, we see that Paul studied under uh, Gamaliel, Gamaliel, I don't know how to say that. Paul studied under the most famous rabbi of that day. So Paul had more like training in these people's minds than Jesus did. Verse 16, Jesus answered, my teaching is not my own. It comes from the one who sent me. 
So this is that, that tension. Like Jesus all the time refers to God, hey, I, I came to do the will of the Father, not my will, but his be done. The teaching, I've been sent from God. The teaching is from God. But it's also very clear that Jesus claims to be God. I think, I don't, I, I don't believe that this is saying, hey, Jesus is less than God. Jesus is saying, hey, I've said this from the beginning. John chapter one makes it really clear that I come from God, I'm sent from God. The message that I bring is from God. You're wondering where my credentials come from? You wonder why I understand this so well? I'm from God, I am God. He said, I don't need a human to teach me. There were many, many false messiahs in that day. Many, many, there weren't, Jesus was not the only one claiming to be the Messiah. Many, many Messiahs. So people were trying to sort through it and Jesus did not fit their box of where this Messiah, where this rabbi could come from. Verse 17 is maybe one of my favorites. Anyone who chooses to do the will of God will find out whether my teaching comes from God or whether I speak on my own. Whoever speaks on their own does so to gain personal glory. But he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is a man of truth. There is nothing false about him. So verse 18, Jesus talks about how um, there is, there is uh, selfish ambition surrounding religion. People come and they speak on their own and they try and get accolades and, and, and they, there's something in it for them. And he's saying, that's not the way that I am. I come and I come in a humble way. I want you to know the truth and so I'm not, I'm not self-seeking glory. And so he comes in a very humble way. But I love verse 17, don't you? Anyone who chooses to do the will of God will find out whether my teaching comes from God or whether I speak on my own. Do you know why I'm not scared of the word deconstruction? As long as it has this idea of taking my faith, pushing it through fire so that it comes out more scripturally and Christ-centered, is verse 17. If your heart is genuinely to know God, if your heart is not, hey, uh, the reason I'm deconstructing my faith, by, this is true, by the way, the reason I'm deconstructing my faith, some of you, is because you don't want to live your life uh, in, in submission to God at all. Like the reason, the, the conflict for you is as you've read something in scripture, as you found out something to be true, you don't want anything to do with that. So you construct a way that I can take this piece and take this piece, but it's not genuine. It's not true. You're doing it because in your heart, I really want to live this way. And so let me construct a version of this faith that works for me. That is not what I'm talking about at all. What this verse is saying is if you genuinely are seeking to know God and you make scripture and biblical community and learning from those that have gone before, but not just swallowing it whole, saying, okay, I'm gonna test whatever's been told me through uh, scripture. It says, you can't miss. You can't miss. Like you will come to know the truth if you're genuinely seeking God. So if that's you today, I just wanna encourage you, good job. That's not all of you. Some of you are deconstructing and, and making a pile because and it's gonna sit underneath your bed. I don't want it to sit under your bed. That's dishonest. You're deconstructing because you don't like some of the ideas that you're finding. That's not what I'm saying. If you genuinely seek God, I believe you will find him. I think verse 17 makes that really clear. If you're genuine in your pursuit of God and you're not just making excuses for how you want to live your life, Verse 17 should give you incredible hope. Verse 19 through 24, Jesus is going to kind of bust uh, the chops of the religious leaders a little bit. I'll try to kind of explain that as quickly as I can. Has not Moses given you the law? Yet not one of you keeps the law. Why are you trying to kill me? So basically he's saying, you guys, you religious leaders, you, you uh, very like theologically inclined people, you're hypocrites. Like you know in your heart of hearts, you can't even keep the law of Moses. And, and, and he says, why are you trying to kill me? Like you're, you're a bunch of hypocrites. You can't keep the law, but you're trying to kill me because I did something that was unlawful to you on the Sabbath back in chapter five. And so he, he, they have a little conflict there. Um, verse 20, he says, you are demon possessed, 
the crowd answered, who is trying to kill you? I don't think you should read too much into verse 20, like demon possessed. I think that would translate, uh, dude, you crazy. That's supposed to be funny. Okay, too, too hard of a topic. Dude, you're crazy. I don't think we should say, hey, they actually believed that there was a demon inside Jesus. They just thought, dude, you're, you're a little bit crazy. Who's trying to kill you? Um, you know, at this point, the crowds aren't trying to kill Jesus. It's really the religious leaders. Verse 21, Jesus doesn't even answer him, just continues. Jesus said to them, I did one miracle and you are all amazed. And again, this is back in John chapter 5, verse 1 through 15. He broke the rules according to them. And now Jesus must die. Jesus is reminding them that their focus on outward appearance and rules, it is misplaced. Verse 22, this is going to get complicated, but stick with me. Verse 22, yet because Moses gave you circumcision, though actually it did not come from Moses, but from the patriarchs, you circumcise a boy on the Sabbath. Okay, so uh, we, we get circumcision before Moses through Abraham, and it was supposed to be this idea of God's covenant and the mark of the covenant of God's people with him. And so the idea behind it is that they were actually, what, what Pastor Sway talked about last week, he said, tie your muscles are useless. Uh, the word there is actually flesh. And so the idea of circumcision is that the people of Israel would cut off part of the flesh to show that, they, that God was going to do something for them that they could not accomplish on their own. God was going to protect them, give them a land and do something for them that in their flesh, they could not accomplish. And so then Moses said, hey, on the eighth day, every kid needs to be circumcised. But circumcision was considered work. And so when a baby was born on the eighth day, let's say a baby was born on Sunday, the, or the Sabbath, let's say Saturday, the following Sabbath, that baby would, by law would need to be circumcised. So that was the rules, but they did that. And they did not consider anyone that would need to like be executed because they broke the Sabbath. And so he's like, he's pointing out an error. Like you guys don't even follow this yourself. And you're trying to kill me for it. So I know that's complicated, but the idea of these, these two major things that Jesus comes into uh, conflict with him over. One is circumcision. And what you're going to see later on, the Apostle Paul talks about this in Galatians. One of my absolute like youth pastor favorite verses in the Bible, when they're arguing about circumcision, like, no, 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 circumcision is really important. You need to continue to do this tradition or you are not a Christ follower. Without circumcision, it's impossible to be saved. And the Apostle Paul takes it on like, hey, let me just tell you, I wish that you would just go ahead and cut it all off. Like that's how stupid your idea is. Like it's, it's an amazing youth pastor passage that everybody perks up there. But Paul's trying to point out, hey, you're pl placing way too much emphasis on this external tradition and you're missing the boat completely. The Sabbath, Jesus talks about that in, in chapter five as well. Um, like he heals on the Sabbath and he says he's Lord of the Sabbath. The idea behind the Sabbath, do you know what it is? Like we rest so that uh, God, we can show our trust in God so that God can do something that we can't do for ourselves. So I'm not gonna work on the Sabbath. No one in my household is gonna work on the Sabbath because we're gonna trust God that he's gonna do something for us that we cannot control in our lives. Like I work really hard all week, but there's one day a week that I'm gonna make, make sure that I show God, I trust you. Yeah, I'm gonna work hard, but I, I trust you to do something that I cannot do for myself. So these two religious practices were supposed to like draw people into a closer relationship with God. And what happened was they actually exchanged a relationship with God for these practices. They became the center focus. They, they traded it for, knowing, uh, for knowing, knowing God or these practices. This makes more sense. Let's just do these things. It fits in my theological framework a little better. So much so that when Jesus showed up on the scene, God showed up on the scene they did not have room in their theological framework for the son of God, for God in the flesh, because they love these traditions so much. <clears throat> Verse 23, he explains it a little bit more. Now, if a boy can be circumcised on the Sabbath so that the law of Moses may not be broken, why are you angry with me for healing a man's whole body on the Sabbath? He's saying, hey, this little like, you can do circumcision on the Sabbath and it's not breaking the law so nobody has to die. But I do the work of God and this man who has been sick 
and lame for 38 years and I heal him and he walks and that's the reason that you want to kill me? Do you guys realize how messed up this is? Jesus is letting them have it. And the final verse we're going to look, look at here is stop judging by mere appearances, but instead judge correctly or rightly. He's like, will you stop paying so much attention to the appearances and the systems and structures that you've created and, and get your head in the game a little bit more? There was such a misunderstanding of the law and the, and the rituals. They were supposed to draw people closer to God and it be, had become a substitute. They had exchanged the appearances of knowing God for actually knowing God. So here, here's what I want to do. Uh, I want to close. The band's going to come. And, and here's what I want to do. I, I, I want you to think about Legos. Go home, play with Legos, talk to your kids. I, I think there's some challenges to raising kids in the church. Um, extra challenges, right? I think our kids learn more about God and the way we treat them, the way we treat our spouses than they do any other place in their world. School, friends, it's you, mom and dad. It's how you treat one another. It's how you um, show Christ, show the gospel in your house. Parents, I just want to encourage you to not just be satisfied with your kid keeping their nose clean. Your kid keeping their nose clean is not the same as knowing Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. It's for sure not the same thing as having a vibrant relationship, a, a, a grateful, dependent relationship with Jesus Christ on an ongoing basis. Please don't settle for that. Try to enter into that mess and, and say, okay, how do I encourage you to be a good citizen, live a holy moral life without becoming consumed by this, that this actually replaces a relationship with God. And I'm satisfied with that. I'm good with that. Please don't make that mistake. Mom and dad, do the hard work of, okay, help your good behavior that you want your kid to, to have be an outpour, an outflowing of a relationship with the Lord and Savior of the world. The other thing is if you're here today and like you would say, Ty, my faith is like this box of Legos. I've completely deconstructed my faith, Ty. Like the, 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 ver that stuck to my finger. The version of faith that I was handed as a kid just doesn't work for me at all. Like in this cute little package and, and it sits on a shelf and, and it just doesn't work. So I kind of deconstructed and threw it in a box and it doesn't work for me at all. Can I just challenge you? I'm really proud of you for deconstructing, right? Good job, like taking the parts that didn't work. Two things, doubt your doubt. It's okay to like, okay, I'm not really sure that my doubt is in the right place. That's a good thing. You should doubt your doubt in this process. You're not the smartest person on the planet. You should doubt your doubt sometimes. But don't leave it in a box. Don't leave your faith in a box under the bed somewhere. Do the hard work of, of saying, okay, what, what are the, the important pieces here for me? And let me give you a couple guides. Number one would be scripture. You're not as smart as you, as you think you are. Use scripture as your guide always. Don't trust your heart. Don't, don't like say, hey, my heart is in conflict with this piece of scripture. Therefore, I'm going to toss this away. Scripture trumps your emotions every single time. Otherwise, you're just going to have all these different versions of faith that are not true. Jesus had such a high view of Scripture. And I think if you're truly seeking God, to know God, Scripture has to be the base. The second thing is community. I know it sounds counterproductive to say, well, if I'm like questioning my faith and like kind of taking some parts out of it, church is the last place that I'm welcome. Not true. You are welcome here. We need you here to ask the hard questions as long as you're genuine like if you're just kind of, you want to complain and you want to fight and you want to argue, there's plenty of churches you can go to. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but if you're here and you've deconstructed your faith because of personal experience, because how you've been treated or the version that you were handed just doesn't quite seem right, man, as long as you're genuinely seeking God, you're welcome here. You're welcome to ask the hard questions. Put your faith through the fire and see if you don't find out the truth about who Jesus is. Let it lead you to the person and work of Jesus. And some of these traditions that don't make sense for you, throw them away. You should. Jesus is. For those of you that have been Christians for a really long time, like me, 50-ish, some, let me talk to you just for a minute. I think it's, it's difficult to know who to identify with in this passage, isn't it? 
Like, okay, I'm, I feel like I want to stand with Jesus. And like, I want, the world hates me, so maybe I'm standing with Jesus. I don't know where your heart is today. But can I challenge you as a church that some of the politics that you believe in, some of the traditions of faith that you are so sure that maybe those need to go through some fire so that it comes out refined. Some of the things that I hear people say in the name of Jesus have zero to do with who Jesus is, who Jesus was, the work that he did, or anything that's found in the Bible. You just believe it so strongly and you read your Bible that way. Can I encourage you? Like, it's okay to have those beliefs. Just don't call it Christianity. Just don't call it follower of Jesus beliefs. Take our faith, every one of us, whether you've been a believer for two years, whether you've been a believer for 20 years or 40 years or 60 years, take our faith and push it through the test of fire so that you're not exchanging knowing Jesus with traditions and rituals and, and religion instead of a relationship with Jesus Christ. God, today we thank you for this passage. And God, my heart for anyone here today that's struggling to try to make sense of, is there room for Jesus in my life at all? God, would you speak to them this morning? Would you lead them in a path that leads them to the person and work of Jesus Christ? And then after that, would, would their faith begin to build some of the things that Jesus wants our lives to be about if we're a Christ follower? God, I pray for the heart of stubbornness to not be in this. I pray for the idea of, of selfish ambition to not be in this. That each person here can struggle with this idea of who Jesus is. And that whatever my preference is in my heart, God, that you would burn those up. And that maybe I wouldn't cling to those quite as tightly. Jesus, you are the foundation for everything in our life. You are who we cling to. There's no other traditions or religious ideas. May they not be a block for us as we cling to Jesus, our firm foundation. In Christ's name, we all said, amen.